Hi, I'm Randy Reed, editor of the Edison Report, and I am here with Manish Bhandari, the CEO of GE Current, comma, a Daintree company. I always like to put that comma in there. Manish, how are you? I'm good, Randy. I'm good. These are strange times, but uh, it's good to meet with you. Finally, well, you. I must say. Yes, it's very good to meet with you. And we uh, welcome you to the audience of the Edison Report. And this is kind of an opportunity for our audience to get to know you. I welcome that and thank you. So your heritage, of course, uh, GE and Jeffrey Imel started as the CEO of GE on September 12th, 2001. Okay, the day after 9-11. And of course, the whole world had changed. In essence, you are starting now, kind of right at this pandemic, and the world will probably change even more than it did after 9-11. What are your thoughts about that? None of us has ever seen before. I completely agree with you, Randy. This will reshape who we are, both as individuals and as society. And I think as a company also, we will change because of that uh, in there. If there is a silver lining, I think it is, if it had to happen, this is the time when we are in the midst of reshaping the company. It allows us to set it on the trajectory it should be on versus if we had been doing this for three, four years and then it would have been another reset. Okay. So I think we completely recognize the gravity of the situation, but we will reshape the company along those lines. So, uh, Manish, tell our audience a little bit about what you are doing in regard to the COVID crisis right now. Essentially, when this happened, the COVID crisis, like any other responsible business, we needed to assess immediately how to react to a crisis event which by doing the right thing for our people, for the industry and for the community in there. We accelerated our disinfection portfolio. Uh, we announced it almost six months ahead of the schedule uh, out there. And then uh, th this has been an interesting side project uh, here. We have a facility very close to Neela Park uh, called Ivanhoe. Uh, and it's a phosphor facility, uh, been around for 50, 70 years. Uh, we converted that phosphor facility to a hand sanitizer manufacturing. A hand sanitizer is under the GE Current brand? Under the GE Current hand sanitizer brand. And uh, we we are uh, we basically repurpose the entire facility for it. Uh, we are uh, providing the hand sanitizers just now, essentially to our customers and distributors, uh, so that we, we are part of the industry in certain ways uh, in there. And this was I, I look at it as all aspects of what can I do? Okay, if I can make hand sanitizer, when that's what is required the most, let me get it out to everyone uh, in there. So yeah, thousands of gallons being produced every day uh, of hand sanitizer just now uh, in there. But one of the big decisions we've taken is we had a patent on uh, one called UVA, but I would look at it the 280 to 380 nanometer bandwidth. We have a patent which is all across the, uh, for all lighting applications in that domain. We recently took a decision to open up uh, that uh, the patent for licensing because, you know, for example, I will have the two by twos in uh, UVA or the, that, that frequency because that frequency with uh, pulsing can be used for a lot more than what it has been used in the past because it has a much higher energy than the regular purple UVA which we have out there. But for example, if I want to put that light on an ATM machine, on that punch pad, I, uh, GE current isn't going in there. So we are uh, now beginning to license it to a much broader sort of portfolio players who operate in lighting, but not in the kind of lighting we are in. And that is again, we believe is one of the ways we are playing a role in dealing with the crisis here uh, in that. Okay, excellent. Well, I had no idea about the hand sanitizer. So uh, congratulations uh, on that, and I look forward to uh, to trying that sometime. <laughs> you sold what I call the smart city business a few weeks ago. Can you tell us a little bit about the decision to offload that business? Uh, 
I think we have offload is the right technical term, but essentially what we have done is we have transitioned that business to a new trajectory here. See, it's a solid, innovative technology and a lot of money has been invested in it over a period of time. But as we looked at what our strategic agenda is going to be for us, for this new company, it became an adjacency in here. So we looked at what would be the right home for essentially what is a technology play here. And Ubiqua soon emerged as a solid home, given that they are a pure play cities company out there. So it was a perfect home for City IQ, for the technology and some really great people. Now on our end, we will continue to build on our leadership position in outdoor and railway environments with an overlay of grid technology. So none of that changes. In fact, it accelerates. But the Ubiqua piece of technology needed to be in a pure place cities environment. And I'm glad it's at the right home now. OK, so you mentioned outdoor and, and that is sure one of the strengths that you have. Let's take the Hendersonville, North Carolina facility. What is happening today as we speak at that facility? Are they in production? Oh, absolutely. They are in production. Now, it's a different world from where it was 10 weeks back when this uh, shutdown started. They are in production at capacity. 100% of the people are there. And I am, you know, we are, I'm both proud and feel lucky for the fact that there are no COVID cases in our entire organization anywhere just now. Wow. But, a huge deal. Congratulations. That's a well, huge thanks. Uh, you know, I'd like to take credit, but I do recognize it is something that we all can do our best, but it can happen tomorrow and maybe happen 10 days back and I'm not aware of it. Sure. But we have to do the best what we can for our people and their safety in there. So from day one, we implemented all those things which are we'd like to stay ahead of the guidelines a little bit. So whether it is thermal scanning, whether it is mass, there's distancing, plexiglass, working in groups, we implemented each and everything. Uh, but at, and at the same time, you know, uh, it is also there is a softer aspect to this. Uh, this is not just a recession. There is a difference here. There is a degree of fear which comes in into the conversation when it, you know, normal recession, fear and work doesn't mingle. Stress and work does. But fear and work is a different element in here. Hey, that's a good point. Yeah. And uh, I'm completely cognizant of it. And, you know, one of the things we gave you allowed all our employees was you don't feel like working from home in jobs which allowed it or people who were, you know, at the, at the point of time who said, I don't feel like coming in to work in a factory. Absolutely. OK, we will work with you on all of those elements. Uh, and Henderson will, Acuna, LPO. We applied exactly the same script. We were classified as an essential needs company, and I'm glad as an essential industry because that's what we are. We are essential to everything which is going on just now. Uh, and it is part of it is to keep the business running, but it is also our, in some ways our moral obligation to keep it running uh, in there. Uh, so that's exactly what we have done. Uh, the LBO, uh, the Hendersonville plant is fully up, fully staffed. Uh, I think we actually took on some temporary workers also on uh, additionally. And we continue to work through uh, pretty much as normal as one can be in these environments. So if you added temporary workers, business, at least outdoor business, must be good. And I'm surprised because we're really hearing that uh, the industry is on tough times right now and there are not a lot of sales occurring. I think it would be wrong for me to say that the world is perfect and the orders are booming. It just isn't the case out there. The markets are soft, they are very patchy and they are highly unpredictable. I think the challenge for a business is how do you react best to these changing situations? So yes, we have been blessed with some very solid relationships over the years. Uh, we continue to enjoy good work in certain pockets, but there are pockets which have been soft. We have cycled up and down based on what the needs are. At this point of time, I think it is okay. I think the broader question is, in some ways, where are we going here? 
you know, we kind of saw the drop off. When the drop off came, there is a new normal which is in here. Uh, the part that I continue to debate to myself, like everyone else out there is, what is the trajectory here over the next three to six months? And uh, I, don't, I don't even want to spend time on the six to 18 months just now. I think what is it for the next three to six months is what my focus is. And I think we will continue to work and react along those lines. So. Okay. And, and what do you think we will see in the next three to six months? I'm not seeing the V-shaped recovery, which uh, some highly optimistic uh, folks have forecast. I, I would, uh, I'm not a pessimist. Uh, I, I essentially actually always classify myself as an optimist, but we have to be cognizant of what's happening in the environment just now. You know, in the industry that we all operate in, there are two driving forces uh, from what I uh, gather and understand and have worked with. One is the essential investment cycle. Who's investing in what at a given point of time? And in the current scenario, the second one, which is absolutely important is, which are the states where installation is going on or not in there. You cut one of those two and the engine will stop uh, in there. Uh, so I think the installer community has done a fabulous job all the way through from whatever I have seen up till now, they have kept the wheels of this industry running. I think it's the investment play that we will have to see I do not think we will see the return of the investment exactly the way it was. The investment will come back, but it will go in different directions uh, in there. You know, I'm, I'm seeing, for example, we see a lot of strength in a very strong portfolio of ours in horticulture, for example. You know, that, that is a very interesting domain for us to work in. We, we obviously have a very strong product line which came out of our LBO acquisition. And as the warehouse uh, explosion occurs, we see a very strong demand for that also. Will the commercial properties market be soft? Yeah, absolutely. It doesn't need a rocket scientist to say that the commercial property market is in for a little bit of a soft period here till things recover. So you, like many manufacturers, do, uh, do source from China. Do you think there will be a backlash in the industry where people will not want product from China? And will you be making any moves there? I think the world of globalization is definitely going to see a shift uh, from what it has been. I'm not exactly sure about the backlash to be able to say anything in the specific terminology. I will tell you this, that I haven't seen anything up till now. But what I do know is that as manufacturers, we will all have to watch the lens of our supply chain. Uh, which are in there and readjust accordingly. Now, for us, we have been largely a pure North America play, pure play for most of the our uh, structure, our existence, our supply chains. There are certain piece parts which do come out of uh, China, but I am not seeing a radical, you know, I'm not seeing the radical U-turn uh, which one may anticipate here and given some of the things we hear in the media. But I do think that we will be able to react with whatever happens. And at the same time, as a business, our reliance on China is much lesser than a lot of other industries out there. Uh, other industries or other companies? Because I do think our industry has a significant reliance on China. I, I apologize. I didn't mean other companies. Okay. Under, understood. Understood. Congratulations on that and not being so dependent. So you mentioned horticulture as one of your strengths. What are some other areas that you're focused? You know, you kind of look at this uh, and I, I step back on that, Randy, to an extent that uh, you take the business out of GE and you say, okay, what are you going to do with this uh, thing here? Uh, you know, how do you, how do you, so the first mission for us in this whole thing became that it is now a focused company. It's a focused company on professional lighting and controls, or call it commercial industrial lighting and controls, but with a very big infrastructure play in there. And we have to kind of define because we are fixtures, lamps, roadways, specialty. We've all got all of that. Controls is the future as in, again, 
the world knows it. And Dane Tree Controls, both distributed and networked, which is out there. And Specialty Materials is another play which we have, which not a lot of other industry players do in here. So I look at this whole thing and I say, essentially, we believe in intelligent fixtures and environments because we believe in the efficiency of a connected world. So now you take that rather macro statement and you say, okay, with all that, what do you want to do? I want to invest in innovation and reach. That's what I want to do here. So product portfolio expansion and adjacencies in horticulture are very important for us. Cellular now network, the networks for roadways, because mesh networks, we've always had a very strong play, but cellular networks for roadways is again something that we would be working extensively on and uh, rolling it out. Feature enhancement for distributed and network building controls, we will work that. Okay. Fixture portfolio for specification market. And to an extent, we will continue select lamp innovation, uh, which is in there, which tends to can kind of get embedded very often these days, but we have been a very strong lamp company over this. So that's kind of our product approach. But the other part of it is, we got to have a very close partnership approach with agents and distributors in there. So that those are kind of the areas that I did that kind of sure. touch the areas that you were looking for. But let's expand on those agents and distributors. Um, you will continue working through the rep network. Do you see any shifts to okay. online? No. Okay. So you're committed to the rep agency current network. I. Uh, you know, every uh, I personally have had the fortune of working in multiple industries, although most of them associated with energy uh, over the years. As I look at what the lighting industry is, I think agents and distributors play a crucial part in the ecosystem of this business here. Uh, I, I recognize there are a few resets because this company comes out of a GE environment and becomes a pure play here. There's a degree of refocusing which is required. However, from a pure how you approach the marketplace, agents and distributors have a solid play in this ecosystem because essentially they are working so close with a highly distributed customer base that the requirements, there are a lot of manufacturers who would like to say that I can meet each and everything out there, but there is a bundling effect which goes in into that. Agents and distributors are the ones who help drive that. So, it is absolutely important and essential that agents and distributors be continued part of not just GE current, but for each and every company's strategy. Uh, I, I believe in this e-commerce. I believe in where the world is going to. But I also believe in the value of human relationships, which have always driven every industry out there. Now, one of the elements that uh, it's not just good enough to say, Agents and distributors are important uh, in there. I think as a company, we got to look at ourselves also. And we say, what am I doing to help agents and distributors be more successful at what their job is in there? Right. And, you know, there are some standard things. I got to have the right product portfolio for them to sell. It just can't be the width. It has to be the depth piece of it associated with it. Uh, but ease of doing business is an extremely important agenda item uh, in there. Uh, we want to be the easiest company to do business with for all agents and distributors, and we will continue to focus on that. And I assume that's yes. one way you're competing and fighting against what I call big China LED, because they come in with these great low prices, but they're very difficult to do business with. They are difficult to do business with, but also, you know, one of the things, uh, whether it is uh, GE current as a standalone company or GE before, we've always been there. We are known for our quality and reliability. We are known for the fact that our out of the box failures are absolutely minimal to none uh, in there. A lot of good people have worked over the years in this company to create roots, foundations of a solid business in here. So, that is the engineering side of our brain, right? The issue is that the agent network is vast and the time is limited 
we got to have our systems set up in a certain way that they are not wasting time trying to get the information from us. Frankly, we should be right there at the doorstep helping them get their things done. That, that's how I look at it. Uh, whether it is China, whether it is any other competition, but I think that is just the basics of how you run a good business in there. Okay, that's very exciting. We're extremely happy to hear about the m a We think that's very good for the industry. Uh, headquartered in Cleveland, Neela Park? We absolutely are. Okay, and we'll remain there? That's what the intent is. That's where the roots are. Can you explain to our audience the importance of the lighting designer, architects, engineers, specifications for GE Current? I can't preach to the choir here in saying that the lighting designer and architects are very important because they are definitely very important in this entire ecosystem. They are defining the specification cycles which go in into it. And they have the broader view of what a finished building would look like versus a pure play lighting supplier in here. So for me, actually, the bigger issue was how am I as a company interacting better with them? And one of the elements which was missing in our profile 15 months back was we had very limited resources in terms of specification engineers which are out there. Uh, we've added several of them uh, in every area, in every region here. And the specification engineers work on both the aspects, both lighting as a fixture and lamp combination in there, but also a lot on intelligent controls environment. Because, you know, again, the, the efficiency of connected work, the importance of controls is nobody is going to debate that, that controls is going to be one of the most, if, if not the only important element as we go in the future here. But one of the very distinctive aspects of controls is it always needs to be end customized uh, in there. So having the specification engineers out there working hand in hand with the people who are visualizing the entire finished product, I think is very important for us as a company to work with. Okay. American industrial partners, they purchased this business. Do you know why they purchased it? You know, American industrial partners has been focused on American industrial assets that are mostly carved out from large corporations. If in private equity there was a pure play, they are kind of a pure play in into this uh, domain. Uh, so uh, while it's a third name in their word, but they essentially lead with an approach to partnering with the management team post a car walk. And this is, they've been in the business for 30, 35 years, and this is exactly what they do. Uh, they are very well funded. And uh, I, I think it is relevant for your audience that they like the lighting, lighting as an industry. Now, they are, in, you know, private equity comes in lots of shapes and sizes there, but uh, they are an engaged but patient partner, primarily focused on value creation. I call them kind of an old style private equity. Take it out of a large corporation, make it a good standalone company. At some point of time, there is a trajectory where it becomes, a, there is a different trajectory for the business in there, but they are not, uh, you know, buy and flip it right away kind of a, a player in there. So they get involved in uh, defining an operating agenda, which touches all the aspects of the business in there along with the management team. And then they essentially have a hands-off approach where the management team gets focused on the value creation pieces of it. So the actions over the last 15 months of converting GE Current to a focused industry player speak for themselves because Positive feedback from partners and customers has been very exciting. And uh, I think this will be good for GE Current and for the industry. AIP is investing in the business. Oh, they absolutely are investing. And uh, as I said, that they like the lighting industry. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see more investments from that them in this space. Okay, in the M&A for lighting. I mean, for lighting, obviously, with GE Current as a vehicle in there. How much of your time is spent with them 
how much of your time is spent running the lighting business? Hardly any with um, uh, the AIP folks. Um, I would say less than 5%, if that much. Uh, in the Congratulations. Congratulations, because that's really good. We, we well, have a lot of stories about that. It, it, is, it is an interesting element because you kind of have to do a bit of a DNA match when you choose to do a job transition in there. You know, I, I came out of Emerson, which is which has made a decentralized approach to managing businesses efficiently as a part of their core philosophy over the years uh, in that. And uh, I, while I think uh, the investors, partners, inputs are always welcome, but the management has to do the day-to-day -day job uh, in there. So you no, know, we, we keep each other informed, but essentially, I am focused on managing this business in there. All right, so we're in 2020. In a few sentences, what will GE Current look like in 2025? We intend to be a very entrepreneurial and dynamic player in the lighting industry. Uh, we intend to have significant critical mass in this space. We want to be known as a company which is which builds on its quality and reliability roots but has innovation inherent in its constant DNA. What we do want to do is we want to be an essential player of the lighting industry. Uh, we want to have a bigger critical mass footprint here. That is going to come through two elements in here. The first one is going to be an organic growth element in here, which is essentially going to come through innovative products as well as the reach expansion with our agents and distributors. The other one is going to be a selective and specific M&A strategy in there. Uh, we intend to be a part of the industry in all its dimensions and M&A is going to be an inherent aspect of that. That is what will create the 2025 GE current and that GE current will be still a focused lighting industry player. Um. Before we go, tell our audience a, a little bit about your background in, in Emerson. Um, I, I've had uh, a phenomenal career out there with uh, two very great companies. And as you can see, I don't, uh, in the last 27 years, I've moved jobs only twice. Uh, I worked with the Timken Company out of Canton, Ohio for 10 years in lots of locations around the world. And then I worked for the last 17 years with Emerson. Um, over the years, uh, we lived a bit of a corporate gypsy family lifestyle with 10 international relocations. And before you ask me, the marriage is doing very well still. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, so over the years, I worked in first in different functional areas but for the last 17 years i've been in general management capacity for a long long time uh, running businesses as diverse as telecom data center industrial backup power and recently a very large portfolio of companies associated with iot and automation uh, within emerson's uh, uh, discrete and industrial portfolio or managing the discrete and industrial portfolio for emerson uh, in there uh, also another part of my career has been a significant i don't know maybe 15 18 transactions on m a domain a lot of carve outs over the years so that's what my trajectory has been and it was time to do something new so here i am very good well, Manish, I want to thank you very much for sitting down with our audience, and we appreciate uh, getting to know you and learning a little bit more about the direction. So thank you. Thank you, Randy. I appreciated the opportunity.